Okay, welcome. This is Pastor Connor. It's uh, 1030. I actually made it on time this week. So if you are joining me for a time of Bible study, fantastic. We're going to be in Acts chapter 2. And I'll give people just a chance to get logged on and ready to go. But Acts chapter 2 is where we're going to be this morning. And we're going to be studying uh, Pentecost. And we had the opportunity to do that this morning. If you didn't get a chance to join us for worship, I obviously encourage you as you have time later in your day, later in your week, to join us for that time of worship. Um, and uh, I also put on the Facebook page uh, the little video I put together this week uh, on Pentecost. It really was a children's video, but I think even if you're not a child, you can benefit from it. Uh, um, welcome your feedback on that as I learn a new skill, uh, certainly as an amateur doing it, but um, it's there for you. If you'd like to share that, you can find that video on the Facebook page and share it. You can find it on the Zion app or on the Zion website, all different places you can find the same thing. And I encourage you to watch that and offer feedback, but then also to share it. Okay, so Acts chapter 2 is we're going to spend a few minutes, uh, about 11 o'clock at the latest when I have to log off because I have a confirmation to do this afternoon, well, I guess still this morning, uh, who wasn't able to be here last Sunday, so I'll do that this, this morning yet. So Acts chapter 2, beginning with verse number 1. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. So again, Pentecost is this week-long festival, also called the Feast of Ingathering, Gathering, the Feast of Tabernacles. It looks back upon their wilderness wandering, the time when they lived in tabernacles, and God dwelled among them in the tabernacles, the tabernacles, little tents. I had a present flavor to it, also called the Feast of Ingathering. So it was a harvest festival, which celebrated the first fruits of the harvest. Uh, so they bring the first fruits of their harvest into these this different, different liturgical celebrations, uh, which would also celebrate the fact that they anticipated that God would um, um, complete the harvest, basically, that they would celebrate the beginning of it and look forward to the completion of it. Now, this is a fascinating uh, piece, kind of some background stuff here. This liturgy that they developed for Pentecost, the farmers and so forth would bring their, their first fruits of their grain into the temple, and the temple rite, or the liturgy, was in Hebrew. And by this time, most Jews didn't speak Hebrew, unless you were the priests. You spoke Aramaic, most likely. Well, you also would have spoken, uh, um, if you're coming from any distance, whatever language that was from that region of the world from which you came. And so you probably didn't understand the Hebrew that was being spoken. So when we get to the part about them being uh, amazed that they're hearing the works of God in their own language, it has more significance than just that, that this was not something they were accustomed to uh, in the temple, right? And also, this Pentecost also had a, fla a future flavor to it because I mentioned uh, this whole idea of ingathering, the first fruits, the anticipation of more to come, but also had um, a day of the Lord flavor to it when they anticipated the, the outpouring of God's spirit and the renewal of all things. And so all of this stuff is wrapped into Pentecost. All right, so uh, keep that kind of in the back of your mind as we journey through. Verse number two, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. So there wasn't wind. So things weren't blowing around, but it sounded like it. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting and divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each of each one of them. So tongues of fire looks like fire, but they're not burned. So sounds like wind, but no wind. Looks like fire, but nobody's burned. I can't imagine what that must have been like. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues. And we know this is languages because this is what shows up here uh, in a minute when it gets interpreted. As the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at the sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language. It's kind of funny, isn't it? I mean, they were bewildered because they understood. <laughs> what was normal was not understanding. But here they were understanding, and they were confused by it. This is a fascinating little piece there. Okay, uh, and I'm going to skip over all the cities and so forth and go over to the end of verse number 11. Okay, so end of verse 11. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. 
basically proclaiming the gospel of God. They, they hear the works of God in their own tongues. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? Uh, it's a great Lutheran question, right? This is all throughout the catechism. What does this mean? So you have your proto-Lutherans here, your, 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 your first Lutheran showing up on the scene because they're asking, what does this mean? But others mocking said they are filled with new wine. In other words, they're plastered, they're drunk. And on the one hand, I can understand why they would think this, but in my experience, drunk people aren't able to speak other languages fluently and putting together coherent praises of the Lord. So it's understandable why they would want to accuse them of this because you have a couple options here. You either have to acknowledge that this is a work of God, that God is doing something, or you discount it by basically saying they're drunk and they're trying to discount it. And look, we do that all the time, right? If we're trying to get out of something, we try to find some loophole where we can get out where it doesn't apply to us. That's basically what some people are doing. Uh, this is not God at work. This is just them being drunk. So we don't have to listen. It doesn't apply to us. It doesn't involve us in any way. Well, Peter's going to stand up and say, basically, um, actually, it does involve you and in a big way. Okay, verse 14, Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. Okay, so a big deal here, what's getting ready to happen. So Peter is going to quote from the prophet Joel. We obviously don't have time to go through all of um, uh, the book of Job. Uh, but um, so if you want just a quick summary of the book of Job, I mentioned this before, go to the Bible Project, uh, watch, watch their video on Job, about seven minutes, and it gives you a good overview. But Joel is, so Joel, when he talks about the day of the Lord, uh, Joel sees different local events as types and shadows, <clears throat> if you will, of the coming day of the Lord. So he references this former locust plague in his book as a type of the day of the Lord. And he references uh, this coming destruction, uh, um, almost in military terms, that he sees as a form of judgment uh, against unfaithful Israel as a type of the day of the Lord. Well, Peter's going to pick up on this, and he's going to take it now to the ultimate day of the Lord, and he's going to position uh, Pentecost in the last days. Now, Joel just says afterward, but Peter interprets that as last days, and, okay, big word alert for a second. Uh, the big word, if you want to impress your friends, is um, eschatological or eschatology. This it just comes from the work the word eschaton, which means last or end, the end things, the end times, the last days, Peter is going to say that those end times, those last days, they have started in Jesus and the outpouring of the Spirit. So, um, well, let me just say, watch the video I put together, uh, and this will help uh, explain that a little bit more for you uh, as to what this is saying. But this is a big deal. Peter is positioning us. That's why I've often called Pentecost God's positioning story. So GPS, God's positioning story. God is saying, here's where you are in salvation history. You are living in the last days. Okay, We still have the former days with us. We still have the days of sin and death and sorrow with us. Days like pandemics. Okay, Those, those are still with us. But the age to come of salvation and renewal has come among us now, all right? So God is beginning to make all things new, and we have the guarantee of this, Scripture will say, because we have been given the Spirit. The Spirit is the down payment on this. The Spirit is the uh, initiation of this. So we have the down payment on, on the promise of renewal in the Spirit. Okay, so uh, one other thing here, just so you're clear, 
uh, what Peter is quoting from the prophet Joel, the prophets did this a lot. They spoke in metaphorical and poetical terms, or poetic terms, all right? So they use some pretty vivid imagery, and these are basically metaphorical in nature in terms of the cataclysmic nature of so forth. It, when he talks about the uh, moon being blood, I don't think we're meant to actually think that there's going to be drops of blood falling off the moon. Uh, uh, this would be uh, cosmic, uh, cataclysmic terms. And in the last days it shall be, verse 17, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Uh, prophesy be, meaning basically declaring the mighty works of God. So prophecy can have a, a, like a predictive element to it, predicting the future sort of thing. Most of the time, prophecy has more of a, um, a, a proclamatory sense to it, a proclaiming the mighty deeds of God, the, uh, the gospel of God. Okay, verse 19 of chapter 2 of Acts. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Okay, so this is going to make you think just for a second. I'll do my best to uh, make this make sense. But so... If you had been alive in Jesus' day and were a typical, devout, you know, pious Jew, when you conceptualized the day of the Lord, well, one, you'd have some of the concepts of the prophets of the, the uh, miniature days of the Lord, like the, the shadows, the types of the coming day of the Lord like in miniature. But you, the idea of the day of the Lord is one cosmic event at the end of time. And what, what we learn in the New Testament, and Peter's making this clear in Pentecost, is yes, that day of the Lord is still one cosmic event at the end of this age, but the age to come renewal has come early, if you will, has come now. And so you have kind of part one and part two. So part one is the giving of the Spirit and the beginning of the renewal, and part two would be the culmination where Christ returns and you have this cataclysmic event of judgment and renewal and so forth. So the New Testament, if you will, stretches these two out or um, um, separates them, but not separates as in total separation, but just think stretch, right? Think, think silly putty and you've got a ball here and a ball here and it just stretches them apart. And here we are in part one and part two is coming. And so part one is the beginning of the 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 uh, age to come we've initiated the age to come this this story of renewal and forgiveness and salvation has been initiated it will be brought to its completion and its culmination on the day of christ's return part two so part one and part two that's what peter's talking about i know a little you know brain stretching there for a minute but that's how you understand uh what peter is saying okay verse 22 and Peter's pretty direct. I mean, I got to give Peter a lot of credit. Preaching this way is dangerous, right? I don't know if I'm totally on board with preaching this way because I'm not sure I'd be able to be allowed to live in town much longer, all right? Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, the man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. So Little little evidences of the day of the Lord. See this mighty wonders and so forth? Little types of the coming day. Like Jesus is going around doing little days of the Lord, or part one of the day of the Lord, all throughout his ministry. It's not the grand and, and awesome final cataclysmic event, but it's these little samples, these little foretastes, these little previews, all right? That's what Jesus, or Peter's saying. You saw him do it. He's walking around doing part one of the day of the Lord. He's doing it everywhere. Right, you saw the signs. This Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. So this was God's plan, was to deliver Jesus up to be crucified. But look what Peter says next. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. This is absolutely phenomenal and just, like again, mind-blowing. God willed it, but man freely did it. And you say, how is that possible? Well, 
I'll put it this way. I'm not God, so I can't figure out how to make it possible, but God uses the free actions of men to accomplish his deed. That this was God's plan all along to put Christ forward as the propitiation for our sins, yet man freely chose to crucify him. Scripture maintains them both. If that makes your head hurt, well, welcome to the club. It's not my place to correct God. It's my place to say, you have spoken, God. I will receive you at your word, and I, I praise you. Okay, verse 24. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him. Okay, now notice, he's already gone to Joel, the prophet, to talk about that, that Joel's words have found their fulfillment in Christ. Now he's going to King David, Psalm 16. He's going to quote a portion of Psalm 16 and say they were about Christ. So, I mean, the whole book is about Jesus, the whole Bible. And this is just two quick examples. But all throughout, you have allusions to and direct references to and direct prophecies of in the Old Testament, all making reference to Jesus. It's all leading up to him. Okay, so he's quoting David, who says in Psalm 16, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades, or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Now listen to what Peter says. Brothers, verse 29. I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. It's kind of like saying, uh, you can go over there and see where he's buried. He's dead. All right, so being there for a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Christ that he would not abandon to Hades, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. So Peter's saying this psalm is about Jesus, that David, who appears to be talking about himself, is actually talking about Christ. The psalm is saying, for you will not abandon my soul to the Hades or let my your holy one see corruption. You won't let, my, you won't let me rot away in the tomb is the idea. And Peter says, well, look, Peter, David's dead. He was talking about Jesus. So you had Joel, now you have David. They both were prophesying about, foreshadowing, preparing us for Jesus. The whole thing's about Jesus. So if you get somebody preaching the scriptures and they miss Jesus, as in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ for your salvation, then they miss the point. Tell them to go back and look again. It's about Jesus. Okay, verse 32. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are, or we all are witnesses. Eyewitnesses. They saw Jesus alive. Right? And we heard this last week with Matthias. The choosing of the witness to bear witness to uh, uh, the resurrection. The, 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 he had to have been there the whole time, from the baptism to the resurrection, all right? And his specific appointed task was to bear witness to the resurrection because everything hinges on it. Peter says, we are witnesses to this. We are called to speak in a public way about the resurrection of Jesus. Hey, verse 33. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. Okay, this is the promise. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. All right, and so he's quoting David again. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him that's Jesus, both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Imagine being in the crowd at this point. This is, this, is, this is a bad moment if you're in the crowd because 
I mean, I think I used this analogy at one point during the week or with some, oh, I forget where I used it recently. But just pretend for a second the NBA season's back on and there's no pandemic and so forth. And you're a huge Lakers fan. And you just found out that the guy that you clocked over the back of the head of his head in the alley and left unconscious, that was LeBron James. So you show up for the Lakers game and he's not playing. I mean, you just knocked out your star player is the point. Jesus is saying, you killed the Christ, the one appointed by God, the one that God chose to be the Savior, you killed him, right? You know, let that kind of sink in for a minute. If you hear that message, you killed him. I mean, the reality is, you go to Isaiah chapter 52 and 53, Isaiah makes that point to us, you killed him. It was your sins that put him there, right? It, it was your sins that required his death. So scripture makes it very clear. So we're not, we're not able to get out of this. We're not able to say, well, it must have been bad to be them. Boy, those, those uh, sorry suckers, they really got called out on it. Scripture calls us out, right? And this is a big moment of crisis in our hearts to realize what our sins have done. So what happens? Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay, he doesn't say, you have to have some amazing Pentecost experience like we just had. You have to speak in tongues or different languages like we did. You have to have some a major outpouring of the Spirit and some remarkable experience that you can point to to be a real Christian. He doesn't say any of that. What he says is, repent and be baptized. That's how you practice Pentecost. That's how Pentecost continues. So we're a Pentecost church because this is what we teach, repentance and baptism. This is what we practice. This is the continuing of Pentecost still today. Pente Pentecost continues as God gives his spirit through baptism and as he forgives sins and he calls us to repentance. Peter says, for the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. This promise is for you. This promise is for your children. This promise is for everyone. We need to be sharing this promise. This is the promise. That there's, there's repentance. There's forgiveness. There's salvation in Jesus. Pentecost continues in Jesus as he continues to bring his spirit among us today through his word, through baptism, and continues to bring people into his fold. Okay, and with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized. And there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Just absolutely remarkable stuff. What, what a great, what a great uh, reading from Acts chapter 2. And to understand that God continues his work of Pentecost still today. We don't have to go out looking for some remarkable experience like they had. That's not the point. The point is that God continues to bring his spirit among us through the means where he's promised to do it. He speaks through in his spirit, speaks through the word. His spirit works through the sacraments. He continues to make us new through these means. We praise God for Pentecost. Let's take a moment to close with prayer. Lord God, we give you thanks for the outpouring of the Spirit, that you are making all things new. You are forgiving our sins and that you are continuing the work of Pentecost. How we long then for the day of the Lord when Christ returns to bring to completion the renewal of all things. Help us walk faithfully. Help us walk uh, in the faith and confess the faith each day. Forgive us when we sin and point us again to your word where your spirit works. Point us again to your sacraments where your spirit works and makes us new. Grant us, th grant us this faith, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for taking the time to be with me today. And I invite you to, uh, well, watch the service if you didn't get a chance to do that. Watch the video we put together and a whole bunch of other things that are there for you on our Facebook page. I invite you to take advantage of those. Always feel free to message me or uh, call me if you have questions. Thanks for joining me.